This is the Bartholomew Town Podcast. Hi, folks. Welcome into another edition of the Bartholomew Town Podcast. It's Bill Bartholomew here with you. Today, we're going to take a look at three things that are happening in the General Assembly this week that you probably haven't been paying attention to. I know I certainly wasn't aware of these. A child care investment in the state budget, auto body bills, and Rhode Island drivers paying some of the highest insurance premiums in the United States, and after school and summer learning legislation that's all taking place right now as we race towards the finish line here in Rhode Island inside the General Assembly. And obviously there's major issues that we've been covering throughout the 2021 here on B-Town. But these are three things that, like I said, you probably didn't know they were going on. I certainly didn't. And today we're going to take a look at them. Now, of course, Governor McKee has hinted, and we've even kind of gotten some information from the leaders of the respective chambers of the General Assembly that we'll probably have a fall session. Um, We've heard that the cannabis legislation may be punted to that point in time. So it may not be a slam dunk. Okay, 2021 is wrapped up in a few weeks. This may go on. Uh, Any of this legislation we discussed today or anything else that's floating around out there, it may be put off into the fall. We'll find out. In any case, interesting stuff today. Hope you enjoy it. And by the way, thanks as always to everyone who's been helping to build the Bartholomew Town podcast by listening, by sharing, by talking about it. We're Rhode Island's number one podcast. And the only reason, the only reason that that happens is because of you out there, you know, sharing it and talking about it and, you know, good old fashioned word of mouth. So appreciate that. Now, I want to invite you tomorrow, Friday, June 18th. We're releasing this episode a day early on the Thursday of this week because a lot of this stuff is going to be heard inside the uh, House Finance Committee today on release day. So tomorrow, Friday, June 18th, 8 p.m., At dusk in Providence, right off Harris Avenue in Providence, plenty of parking, right off the highway, 8 o'clock, myself with my band performing. We've got some great special guests. It'll be my first show back since, I mean, like early 2020. And I've got new music out as well on Spotify, Apple Music, wherever you like to get music. The Bats EP, that's out there as well. Just search for me, Bill Bartholomew, and you'll find it there. But tomorrow night, Friday, June 18th, right in the heart of Providence, Rhode Island. We'll see you there. Okay, let's get to it. Three issues you probably didn't know were going on right now inside the General Assembly here on Rhode Island's podcast of record, B-Town. B-Town. All right, so kicking off our uh, conversation on things that are happening in the General Assembly that you probably don't know about, you may have not, may not know about anyway, weren't paying attention to, um, we're going to kick it off with a, a, a child care investment in the state budget. And we're joined by Leanne Barrett, Rhode Island Kids Count, and Rachel Flume of the Economic Progress Institute. Essentially, the argument is that if we don't invest in childcare, it's hard to get working families, particularly mothers, back into the workforce. There's a survey out there that says about 25 to 30% of women were forced to leave the workforce or reduce their hours during the pandemic due to a lack of childcare options. So that's at the heart of the matter here today. I mean, this is something that has been, we've heard pre-K conversations, certainly from Mayor Alorza and and at the time, Governor Raimondo had also put this out there. Explain the legislation and, and what's happening up on Smith Hill with respect to child care. Okay. Well, um, Rachel and I are, are both work together with the Right from the Start campaign, which is a coalition working on um, several bills that will help families with young children and budget priorities. And the Rhode Island Child Care is Essential bill is one of our um, main bills this year, and it is something we've been working on before the pandemic, our um, child care subsidy program, which helps low-wage working parents um, be able to afford child care because they don't make enough money to pay for the cost of child care on their own. So it's been a priority for decades for the state and the federal government to help low-wage workers low each parents work um, and help them with the cost of childcare. So um, the child care is essential bill asks um, the state to increase the rates to meet the federal equal access standard. So that's the amount they pay providers to care for low income children. It asks the state to cap family co-payments at no more than 7% of family income, which is the federal affordability standard, similar to, you know, how we have affordability standards for housing, which is, you know, around a third of your income. There's an affordability standard for childcare, which is 7%. Um, And currently, some of our low-income families are required to pay 14% of their income, so twice the federal standard. And the third part is to expand eligibility for the child care assistance program. We um, 
the state cut lots of families off in 2007 um, when we had our first recession and we've never actually gotten those kids back. <laughs> and we know that lots of families, um, almost all families really struggle with the cost of childcare. Um, and so we need to help be able to help more families um, through a subsidy system. Yeah, and that's interesting because of course, Rhode Island forever, the talking point is whenever we go into a recession, we're the first one in, the last one out, just a few weeks ago, I was with Stefan Pryor, and he said that, look, Rhode Island, for the first time, is coming out in the lead of the pack when it comes to exiting a recession or an economic downturn. So financially, this moment is probably a good moment to do it, uh, do, to pass something like this. Rachel, that, that's an interesting, the, the 7% threshold, what other, of, of a person's income, what other criteria make sense to include someone in this in, in, in terms of being a recipient of what this legislation would provide? Sure. So, you know, 7% um, might seem like a lot to folks, but right now it goes up to 14% of a family's oh. income. So um, for low income families, that can be a significant amount. Um, you know, the right now, the income eligibility is about 180% of poverty. So thinking, you know, family of four is about $30,000 a year. Um, we know that a lot of families who are making higher than or earning more than that really struggle to pay for childcare. You know, you hear stories of um, older kids having to stay home, especially during the pandemic. You know, they were in charge of their younger siblings, even while they were trying to do Zoom school um, and other things like that, because they just can't afford um, to to take on those jobs. Or the parent, the mothers. You know, we we've seen lots of news stories where the mothers or or fathers are making the decision to just leave the workforce completely because they can't afford it. So you know. There, the child care is so complicated, but we've seen um, how important it is during this pandemic. You know, we've seen that the economy really can't go back to work if child care providers aren't open. Um, and certainly on the national level, there's been a real focus on making sure that states are able to expand um, the criteria for folks. So the state is getting a significant amount of federal funds um, that it can use for this bill. Um, it's very targeted funding that is going directly, um, it's being intended to directly support programs like this that help low-income families and make sure that um, the programs meet the needs of more parents and also the providers who provide the care. Um, I could go on and on, but the, the, you know, the providers are some of our lowest paid folks in the state. Um, and so making sure that the, the child care centers and family home um, uh, uh, providers are able to reopen, you know, all of them um, have struggled during this pandemic and the state has been very intentional about increasing the amount that they are getting. Um, they're called emergency reimbursement rates that has, um, been a huge lifesaver and meant that a lot of programs have been able to stay open, but we're worried as the state is looking at rolling back the state of emergency, that those rates may um, go back down uh, at a time where we know child care providers are just trying to get them to their feet back under them and figure out what the fall um, looks like for the, for them going forward as more parents are going back into the workplace and schools are getting back to normal. Yeah, certainly if you empower the consumer, then the industry should be able to thrive more than if you have a struggling consumer. There's no doubt about that. What what What's the reaction been like in terms of General Assembly support? Who's an outlier right now in, in terms of anyone in, in, that's an elected official who's against this for any reason? And what's your message to those folks? So certainly we have some real champion champions on these bills in the House. Um, Representative Diaz is an enormous champion in the Senate. Senator Cano is the sponsor and huge champion on these. You know, I don't think there's anybody who's opposed to investing in child care. Um, you know, we think that the there may be some um, confusion about the federal funds and how much can go to do this and um, the importance of spending the money now and making sure that the, the federal funds that can be spent now are spent now. Um, and so I think a lot of what we're talking about right now is making sure that people um, understand how all the federal pots of money work, that we can use them now, that they can um, go into these programs um, immediately, and also um, making sure that the emergency rates are continued. 
um, and that that doesn't get sort of lost um, in the sauce of ending the the state uh, emergency, um, that that doesn't get forgotten about. Um, so I don't think there's any you know huge opponents. It's really just trying to make sure that the math works and that uh, all of the sources um, align correctly. Leanne, you get the last word on this. Feeling optimistic that this will pass here in the what will end up being the summer, I guess, trying to think about when the summer starts. I, yeah, what will be the summer or is this get punted to the fall? How does this play out? Well, we are um, working really hard to see that there are um, changes made in statute. Our General Assembly has been leaders historically um, on lots of, of um, elements of, of priorities that families with young children need. And um, our child care system is set in statute, key components of it, the rates, the eligibility, um, there are co-payments required in statute. So we are hoping the um, General Assembly acts now. As Rachel said, we don't have any opposition theoretically. It's just a, a question of finding the money. And we have the money now. We have more federal money than ever historically. And uh, we know that it will last for at least two years and that we want to make sure that we use it now to help children and families now because um and we need to make the permanent the reality is those pandemic rates aren't just for the pandemic <laughs> those are the rates we should have been paying before the pandemic um and it and that is a key message is that those rates are needed long term um rates at that level in order to have a strong child care system and help families afford access to high quality child care thank you both appreciate it very much Okay, so why does Rhode Island have some of the highest car insurance rates in the country? Well, Frank O'Brien of the American Property Casualty Insurers Association joins us right now to break down what he describes as a pattern of legislation that has led to just that. Thanks, Bill. Appreciate you having me on today. And uh, I'd like to touch bases with you on uh, what's really a pocketbook issue for, for Rhode Islanders. And there's a couple of things. Uh, first of all, the General Assembly in the waning days is set uh, yet again uh, to take up another raft of proposals from the state's auto body industry. And for the last 20 years or so, uh, Rhode Island has passed more auto body related legislation than any other state in the country. And what that has resulted in is a situation where, first of all, it costs more to repair a vehicle here in Rhode Island than it costs anywhere else in the country. Mm. Second thing is that, as we all know, Rhode Islanders pay a lot for their auto insurance. Given that Rhode Island has some of the highest repair costs, it shouldn't come as any surprise to anybody that Rhode Island has some of the highest auto insurance rates. So depending on the source, wherever you go online, Rhode Island is always in the top 10, anywhere from 10th, the third most expensive, and generally 50 to 70% higher than the national average. This has some real world consequences. First of all, if you've got a insurance that's expensive, that means that some people may not be able to afford it, may choose not to buy it. So uh, we've got a very high uninsured motorist rate. What that is, is that people driving around without the required insurance. According to the Insurance Research Council, 16.5% of the drivers on our roads are uninsured. That's the highest rate in New England and one of the highest rates in the country. And unfortunately, notwithstanding some good work done by the General Assembly over the past decade or so, it's on the rise. The legislature simply can't go on adding costs to the system. We've got three more bills pending in the General Assembly that add costs. And whether it's widgets or auto insurance, if you add costs to the system, prices go up. As simple as that. And certainly Rhode Islanders can, or anybody right now, can ill afford increased costs at this point. It's something that Governor McKee has laid out in his opposition to any increase in in, in income or sales tax right now and, and coming out of this moment. But, you know, in general, a lot of people think, oh, well, Rhode Island has high insurance. Maybe it's because the roads are 
not well kept or something like that. Why is it that Rhode Island really has this sort of influence from the auto body repair industry that is that is trickling down to higher costs for the average consumer? Well, you know, there are lots of things that go into the high insurance costs here in Rhode Island. Certainly, the weather is not great sometimes, though today, the weekend was beautiful. Uh, you've got congestion. Uh, you've got bad roads, though the state is repairing those. But you have also got a bunch of things that are controllable. And certainly, whether or not you're going to pass a piece of auto body legislation is certainly controllable. You know, over the last uh, 20 years or so, about two dozen bills have passed. And individually, they may not amount to much, but it's death by a thousand cuts. Uh, now, for example, uh, we've got a bill in the General Assembly that's going to be on the floor on Wednesday, uh, deals with an esoteric issue involving rental cars. Uh, but it's the type of bill that no other state has. No other state has even thought of doing, put in at the behest of, of specific industry and will only serve the benefit of that particular industry, which is a bunch of rental car outfits owned by auto body guys. And you ask, how does this happen? Well, you know, the auto body guys are, are good. They, they play the small local business card very well. They participate in the political process extensively. They go before the General Assembly and basically say, this is a good consumer bill. It's always this, been this way. The Goliath insurance companies, the big guys, they're just put, trying to put the little guys out of business. So they, they do play the David versus Goliath card very well, too. Yeah, and 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 that is quite literally used in some of in one auto body providers commercials here in Rhode Island. That that sort of approach is given, and they they present it as, "Hey, look, you get to deal with somebody local instead of this anonymous national or global conglomerate." But w what's your sense as far as inside right now? Do you get the sense that lawmakers are even aware of this at an acute level? And if they are, do you get the sense that there is going to be a change and we won't see this legislation passed and we won't see additional costs to the average consumer. Change comes very slowly to the General Assembly. Change comes hard. We've got three bills. History will tell me, will tell us that at least one of those three bills will pass, if not two. Uh, the rental car loss of use bill, as I said, is on the uh, House floor on Wednesday. So uh, right now, that's uh, that's secretariat. Uh, that's the one leading the horse race at the moment. But I would imagine that uh, another bill that's out there that deals with uh, recycled auto parts is a, a good runner up at the moment, could cross the finish line as well. That one is particularly egregious because it would uh, basically shut down another industry here in Rhode Island. You've got a lot of um, auto recyclers. And basically what that bill says is that you can't use recycled auto pots. And I thought recycling was good. Uh, the General Assembly passed the climate change bill, and yet there is a piece of legislation that would essentially ban the use of a recycled product which has the uh, impact of putting more carbon back into the atmosphere. And I thought we were trying to take carbon out. Yeah, not much logic right there other than the influence of certain entities and people. There's no other way to put it. Um, last question, Does this, is this something that the average Rhode Islander should be aware of and, and doing their best to lobby uh, against their own pocketbooks being hit right now and certainly even in years to come? You know what? I never met a person anywhere who wanted to pay more for their automobile insurance. <laughs> yeah, and if you want to pay more for your automobile insurance, let these bills go through the General Assembly. If you want to try to rein in costs here in Rhode Island and get Rhode Island out of the top 10 list, this is a piece of legislation to tell your rep and your senator say no to the auto body guys. 
enough is enough. Okay, so our last look inside the General Assembly, three things that you probably aren't aware of that are happening right now, or you, and you probably should be, pertains to after school and summer learning. And there's legislation pertaining to exactly that. And joining us to discuss that, Kyle Bennett and Marlene Guy of the United Way of Rhode Island and the Rhode Island After School Network. Thanks so much, each of you, for joining us here. And, you know, wh- so let, let's talk about what is the specific legislation and what, what's the intended goal here on this stuff? Sure, I'll start. Um, Bill, thank you so much for having us. We're supporting Rep. Julie Casimiro's bill, House Bill 5211. This bill is important because it creates a dedicated funding stream, an annual funding stream that supports after school and summertime programs for our youth. It, it's important because right now the state does not invest in these programs in a meaningful way in terms of reaching the broad youth population in the state of Rhode Island. For every kid that's currently enrolled, there are 59,000 additional kids that are waiting for, excited about obtaining a seat in one of these programs, a space in one of these programs. Uh, They're not meant to sit down. They're meant to really be active and engaged. So what we're hoping to do is to to allow the state to not use temporary investments, although we're happy to receive those as well through the stimulus funding and the ARP funding streams, but to really say we're going to put our stake in the ground and invest in our children in the hours between 3 and 6 p.m. and in the other spaces that exist outside of the school day. Where do we sit right now in terms of the average, so we know the numbers, but an in, in interest level, but programs that, that exist that want to expand? Is there is there a clamoring on their behalf or are we looking to create new brand new programs, sort of a combination of each of them? So there is a lot of interest. We have uh, a ton, hundreds, hundreds of community-based organizations that have provided um, amazing resources year round, summer, after school, um, pre pandemic, and the call for these programs to be able to provide additional services when the pandemic hit. And that is partly uh, because the programs have a really close connection to the community and the people. They are a trusted resource um, for a lot of our communities. And so when they needed help getting connected to technology or having resources to be able to connect to the schools to be able to provide those supports. And then when programs uh, were still virtual and families needed to get back to work. They provided a service, almost a, 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 a subsidiary of a public school because they had a place for the youth to be able to do distance learning. That being said, we also know that um, the Department of Education came out with a LEAP task force report. And in that LEAP task force report, it really called upon our after school and summer programs to be more integral in what is happening, including um, partnering with all of these community-based organizations. And so really thinking about how we can make those connections back to um, the school districts to really start thinking about the services um, that our youth are asking for. And then in all honesty, all of our youth have experienced a trauma and the majority of our youth are saying they wanna be able to be with their friends. They need social interactions. They need to be able to play basketball and board games and just be kids for a little while. And our programs are really great at being able to offer that and be able to be very youth centric. That's something that we've heard a lot in recent times from Cedric Huntley, from Stephen Parry, Mayor Lorza, in response to some of the violence that we've seen in in the capital city and really in a statewide basis. There's right now, I mean, you look at Newport, there were some kids who allegedly stabbed another kid in an Airbnb just a few weeks ago. There's a real need for this on a multitude of levels, not just entertainment, but societal well, do you get the sense that inside the General Assembly there's support for this right now? I do, Bill. Um, in fact, just this past week, I think we have two new representatives who were signing on to the bill. They, by and large, our General Assembly members, they understand the challenges that districts are facing uh, to educate our children, but more importantly, they understand the challenges that our communities are facing in supporting the children and youth um, through this pandemic and beyond. And, and I believe if it weren't for the fact that we're financially constrained, they would have invested in our programs a long time ago. But but they're more and more becoming aware of this opportunity. And I think the, the real truth or fact is um, every single one of them wants our youth to be successful. Yeah. I was just actually going to piggyback off of that. In addition to that, this is really truly like a nonpartisan issue um, because it's not just supporting our youth and what that happens. Um, it is supporting the, the 
the economy as a whole. Families need to be able to have high quality, safe places for their youth to be, um, to be able to fully function, come back into the workforce, um, to be able to attend training programs, to be able to contribute to the economy. Um, and that is one of the things that we want to be able to highlight because all of those you know, tens of thousands of youth who are waiting to get into programs are also youth that are um, being limited, limiting their families with the access to the programs that they can attend. Last question, uh, and I guess each of you can respond to this right now for anyone out there who's listening to this and saying, oh, this is just more, you know, something that that we, we don't need more of this. I can take care of my kids or whatever the, the naysayer would say. What, what do you say to them about the community as a whole and making something like this happen? I'll go first, uh, Bill. What I'd say to that, um, I'd say that they're probably not being honest. I think we yeah. know that uh, as we were all children and youth at some point in our lives, uh, when you engage in risky behaviors, sometimes, particularly in this day and age, the, the implications can potentially be lifelong. Uh, we have another bill in the House that looks at sentencing guidelines for youthful offenders and really thinking about the idea of a child or a youth being charged as an adult for a crime while they can't actually do other things as an adult would. So we know that these hours that are really um, important to have supervision, but more importantly, that they're hours that have a they have they provide an opportunity for our children and youth to really expand on what's happening in the classroom, to explore topics that have been delivered and and theory that's been presented to them. They one of our colleagues used to say they get to put their minds on, their hands on, and their feet on in our programs and really stay active and engaged and live into the dream of after school and summer programming. Um, to kind of talk a little bit about what Kyle brought up, I think one of the biggest things is that our we are hearing constantly from outside agencies, we're talking about colleges and universities, training schools, and the workforce, that our youth are leaving high school not ready. And it's not necessarily the not ready because they can't add, subtract, multiply, and divide. It's they cannot work together in a team. They can't clearly communicate. They can't deal with failure. Um, and these programs are places where youth can fail safely and be able to utilize those skills. They're 21 First century skills. These are the skills that no matter what you do, whether you are working in a frontline staff or you are a, an engineer, you are going to be asked, how do you work well with a team? How best do you communicate? How do you share ideas? These are all these, um, how do you problem solve? And these are opportunities for our kids to be able to use those skills and grow into young adults that will be marketable, that will be successful, um, and be able to utilize the education that they are, they are absorbing absorbing in school into a practical way that becomes extremely useful for us as a whole, as an economy, as a state, um, and just as a community. Rhode Island's podcast of record, B-Town. At HealthSource RI for Employers, we provide access to health insurance to more than 1,100 local businesses and nonprofits, and 96% of them renew through us every year. Maybe it's our choice of 19 different health plans, our 10 years of customizing solutions, or our one local team of dedicated experts helping employers find quality health insurance. See how our numbers stack up for you. Learn more at healthsourceri.com slash employers.